everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Training That Delivers Results, Instructional Design That Aligns with Business Goals, hosted by HRDQU and presented by Dick Hanshaw. Today's webinar will last around 1 hour and 15 minutes. If you have any questions, you can always type them into the questions box. We will be answering questions as they come in live at the end of the presentation or as a follow-up by email if we do happen to run out of time. My name is Sarah Schaefer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Dick Hanshaw, founder and chairman at Hanshaw, Inc., he is consultant, speaker, author, and champion for innovation and quality in performance, improvement, and instructional design. He is a pioneer in the field with 35 years of experience as a learning and performance improvement professional. Dick has served as a consultant for many organizations to help them establish a results-oriented training practice. He founded, he founded his own training consulting firm in 1985. He and his staff developed the Hanshaw instructional model over nearly 30 years of practice. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Dick Hanshaw. I really want to thank you and HRDQ for putting this on today. Um, I'm going to start out by uh, finding out who I'm talking with for a minute here. So um, I'm going to launch this first poll. I want to find out how many instructional designers we have, how many performance consultants, and how many of you are both. I'm really interested, especially in the both. So if you go ahead and complete um, that survey now for me. We'll wait just a couple of seconds while everybody finishes. About half of you have voted so far. Let's see. So far, the uh, instructional designer and both are running about neck and neck. <laughs> and um, only about 16% are just performance consultants. A few more seconds while we finish the voting. OK, so I'm going to assume that 44% um, are instructional designers. 41% of you say you're both. And 16% are performance consultants. OK. And um, so <clears throat> I also want to give you a little idea of how this, um, how this presentation came about. What you see on the screen now is the Hanshaw Instructional Design Model. I just called it that because I've been using it for 35 years, and I figure, OK, I can call it that. Um, what I also did was I decided that the only thing wrong with instructional design models is that they didn't have performance consulting in them. People had told me for about 10 years, oh, you should write a book. And I said, I have nothing to write a book about, that there aren't 400 books on instructional design already, until it occurred to me that you know, this, this is something that people really haven't talked about much. And so I want to give you a little bit of a rationale for why I thought it was important to include performance consulting in an instructional design model. Back in the mid-90s, I happened to meet in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Jim and Dana Robinson, um, who wrote now three books um, on performance consulting, along with about five other business books. What I learned when I met them was that I was probably designing a lot of instruction for my clients that may or may not work, may or may not be a waste of money. And it wasn't really my fault because I was doing what they asked me to do. But it wasn't really a good business strategy to be taking money for things I didn't know were going to work or not. So I learned performance consulting. Um, I actually hired Jim Robinson to come do a workshop for my company in 1996, and now we do those workshops for other people. But the reason I thought it was important to include that instructional design model is as part of the analysis, as you can see, I'm talking about an ADDIE model here. <clears throat> and um, it's really important that we identify what our client's business goal is. And you know, I know your clients don't usually ask you to do this. I know what they ask you for. They call you up and they say, I need a two-hour e-learning program on something. Um, or I need a one-day workshop on something. I know I still get those requests all the time, too. But the point is, we're a much better value-added partner 
if we know what they're trying to accomplish from a business perspective and if we become responsible to help them do that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about performance consulting in the beginning here. Then I'm going to talk more about instructional design. Um, since this is a, this is an ADDIE model, and you know there isn't an there is there isn't one ADDIE model. There, almost all of them out there are ADDIE models. Anything that has analysis, design, development, implement, evaluate in it, which almost all of them do, is an ADDIE model, even if they say they're not one. Um, so we're going to um, focus first on the first three steps, and I <clears throat> I want to talk also about some of the criticisms of instructional design models. People say, well, you know, it takes too long. I don't have that much time to do all that. My clients don't want me to do all that. So we developed um, what we call our cost versus risk rule. And the only thing wrong with instructional design models is that people try to use them the same way every time, and that doesn't necessarily fit. So to give you an idea of how to save time with your instructional design model and still do what's important, try the cost versus risk rule. Weigh the cost of doing a step versus the risk of not doing a step. I've got an exercise at the end here where you get to practice that, but I'm going to talk about that for each step we go through is, you know, how much is this going to cost you and what would be the risks that would make you not want to skip a step? What would be a situation where you know, don't really need to do an audience analysis this time. It's the same audience. I've worked with them before. I'm going to just drag out my old audience analysis. So again, the whole thing I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to save you time because I know everybody's pressed for that, and I'm trying to make your learning more accountable to the bottom line results for your client. So <clears throat> in looking at the uh, the ways to get into performance consulting, there's two ways, proactive and reactive. Reactive is the one that we're all used to. Somebody calls up and says, I need a training program on such and such. Um, the other way you're probably not used to, and that is proactive meetings with your clients. Probably, you know, once a quarter might be all you can do, maybe every other month. Um, but the idea is just call your client up and say, do you have 30 or 40 minutes to meet with me. I just want to see how your business is going. And I know as learning people, we think, hey, we're not really supposed to do that. I've been a business owner for 30 years now, and if somebody on the street that I didn't know walked up to me and said, hey, do you have 10 minutes? I just want to see how your business is going. I would probably talk to them. Business owners, people who really are in charge of a business, cannot resist the opportunity to talk about their business. So it's not as hard as you might think. Give it a try. Um, <clears throat> why use performance consulting? Well, I had this, uh, uh, actually Tom Labonte is the consultant who introduced me to Jim and Dana Robinson years ago. I went to visit him in his, um, his new job in Pittsburgh where he had 125 direct reports all training people. And Tom started the meeting off by tol telling them that they were all doing a good job the only thing wrong with training was that they're developing too much training, which confused the heck out of everybody. What Tom meant was is that sometimes you're developing training to solve a problem that can't be solved by training. So my suggestion is the answer to your busy schedule and how to be able to get everything done is don't just do training for every training request that comes your way. I'm also not suggesting that you say no to those training requests. I'm asking rather that what you do is reframe that request and turn it around. So performance consulting, then I have a de definition over here. <clears throat> it's a process that produces business results. Um, as training people, you may not be asked to do that, but the performance consultants in the group know that you're asked to do this, and I'm sure you do that fairly often. Um, and the idea is that you want to maximize the performance of people and organizations. Now, we're used to looking at the performance of people. The thing we're not used to doing in our profession is looking at, looking at the performance of organizations. So what I would suggest to you is that 
almost all business problems require multiple solutions. There's hardly anything out there that I've ever come across in 35 years of doing this work that is going to be solved by me just doing a training program. I don't think I'm that good, and I just don't think it ever happens. So we're also going to focus on the organizations as well as the people, and that's what makes this a little bit different. Um, right now, I'm going to launch a poll again because I want to find out um, how many of you have access to um, – I need to get to the next slide first. Um, Sarah, can you let me have control again? I want to back up to slides. Oh, Dick, yep, do you see the poll in progress? I, it, I already clicked. It said, do you already have access to the true client? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so we're, we're going to go to the poll. I'm going to tell you what a true client is. This is one of the hardest things to do, I think. The, the true client is the person who kind of owns the business. Um, and you may feel ambivalent about whether you have access to senior leaders who are in charge of businesses, especially if you're in a large organization. So what I'd like to, to find out right now is how many of you feel like you do have access to people at that level, senior managers, people who are in charge of the business, um, and how many of you say, I really can't get access to those people? Okay, we're trending at about 60% uh, yes and 40% no right now out of 75% voted. We'll wait just a little bit more. Okay, so we're still looking at about 60-40. That's good. And we can go back to slides. So here's what the, two, the true client is. They're the owner of that line of business. They're responsible for the performance problem. Um, they know the current business goal. If you are talking to someone and you ask what the business goal is and they don't know, you're probably not talking to the true client. And what you should do in that situation is say, would it be a good idea to find that out? Can we go talk to the person who knows what the business goal is? They know what internal and external barriers there are in the organization. They know strongest and weakest performers, which is really important because um, getting to some of the strongest performers is how you find out what kind of performance is going to solve the problem. Too often we're asked by somebody, get people to do this performance, and this is going to solve my problem, and you develop training for people to get to that performance, nothing changes, and then somebody says, well, that training, that training program didn't work. It's not really your fault. Um, if you can't get to the best practice that leads to the business results, all the training in the world isn't going to help. So you need to make sure you're doing the right thing. Looking at the best performers is a great way to do that. Your true client can also answer questions as you conduct your um, proactive and reactive meetings. And um, they can, most importantly, they can make decisions that affect the business results. So I see that 40% of you out there say, I do not have access to this person. My advice then is to get with um, some senior manager, your supervisor, uh, Talk about the need for performance consulting. There are books out there. There are workshops out there. Um, but most importantly, you need to get that person to agree with you that maybe you need to be talking to the people who can make these different things happen and get your supervisor or manager to help you do that. Um, it's one of the hardest things to do, but it's hard to really be responsible for, for true change. Um, and get results out of your training if you can't do that. So one of my first big pieces of advice, if you want to get results from your training, is make sure you're talking to the true client. So back to um, the instructional design model. Um, <clears throat> one of the tools that we use as a performance consultant is a GAPS map, a needs or a GAPS map. It's a fairly simple process. Here's what a GAPS map looks like. The four boxes on the top are where we identify gaps. The three boxes on the bottom are, is where we identify causes for the gaps. 
So the gaps are fairly obvious. We just want to look on the left side at what should the business be doing? That's that business goal we talked about. What are the current business results? And there should be a gap in the middle. That's what we want to fix. So then we look on the performance side. There's a performance should and a performance is. Same thing. What performance would get the desired business goal? So that arrow that points from business should to performance should is saying that this is very important here. It's saying that um, that business goal should be the dr driver for the performance. So if we're going in and taking a training request and trying to train to a certain performance and we're not linking it to the business goal, we're just taking a shot. We're, we're taking a chance that it's going to fix things. Very important that you identify that business goal. So you can find a gap between what performance should be happening and what performance is happening. And then you want to ask questions about causes. Here's the thing that so many of our clients come to us with all kinds of solutions. Build me training for this. Build me training for that. Build me some kind of communications tool. And they haven't really looked at the causes for their problems yet. So we categorize causes in three areas here. There's things that happen outside the organization, things that happen inside the organization, and we say some of those are our client can control and some of those our client cannot control. And then there's fact, factors internal to the individual. Now that last box, internal to the individual, that's where we usually live. It's skills and knowledge or maybe just um, things that they like or don't like to do because it's not always, people don't, the reason for people to not do a certain performance is not always because they don't know how. <laughs> Maybe it's because they don't feel they're being paid or there's some other reasons they don't want to. So very important to identify these causes. Once you begin to identify causes and do this with your client, you may see uh, some lights go on that, you know, maybe this is not worth wasting training time on. Maybe this is an entirely different cause. So, Again, there is a lot to performance consulting. Um, it might take some of you quite a while to, um, to figure that out and learn to do that. It probably takes a couple of years to transition your organization into practicing performance consulting. <clears throat> but I think if you truly want to get um, results from your training, uh, spend some time in that arena first before you begin to design instruction. So with that said, um, there's a couple of things you have to have it lined up in order to have performance work for you, performance consulting work for you. You have to have access to that true client. You've got to have the time to conduct analysis. And you know, on time, um, sometimes this is just two or three days. At the most, it can be a couple of weeks. Um, we have to get our clients to agree that it's important enough to have time to do that. And I also want to say that not every project requires performance consulting. It's that cost versus risk rule again. And when I wrap up, I'm going to have a little exercise where we can practice that. So um, also you have to have the influence to, sug to suggest those non-learning solutions. Those things that you find out that are wrong in the organization, probably 80% of performance has nothing to do with training needs. It has to do with other things like management, setting expectations, um, rewards, coaching, uh, bad systems or information. There are so many other things that get in the way of performance. It's hard for us as training people to try to solve everything with a training program when, believe me, 80% of performance issues have nothing to do with a training solution. And finally, um, I think it's good to have a, a comfort level with ambiguity because as you start doing more performance consulting with your clients, things might get a little bit murkier before they get clear. But if you follow the should is cause logic, what should things be, what are they, identify the gap, and then find the causes for the gaps, that's going to lead you to better decisions about your solution. So let's suppose now that we have identified a need for training. Maybe there are other solutions in this uh, in this whole problem solving as well. But we know there's at least a training need. So now we're going to continue more with traditional instructional design here. Um, and I'm going to launch um, 
another poll here. Um, I want to find out um, how many of you are doing task analysis at this point. How many of you do a task analysis with your projects? This is my favorite question to ask people. Yes, the no's are slightly winning here. We have about 70% of the vote in, and we're 60-40 no. A few more votes coming in, and that's about it. So about 60% of you are saying that you don't do a task analysis with all your projects or most of your projects. Um, so to those 60% of you, I have a question for you. How can you design training if you don't know what it is that people are supposed to do when you're finished with them? And I know what most people say in this circumstance. If I was looking at you face to face, you would all tell me that you just really don't have time to do that or your client doesn't want to take time to do that. The one thing I think out of this entire process today that will save you time <clears throat> is to begin doing task analysis with your projects. So um, I'm going to show you what I mean by task analysis. Um, it's not something that should take an awful lot of time. And in fact, I'll give you a really um, nifty high-tech tool to do that with. Um, the high-tech approach that we use is sticky notes. We take uh, something like um, three by three sticky notes or four by five sticky notes, and we write a task on each sticky note. Each task should have a verb and an object. And that's the beginning of so many things you're going to do in the instructional design process. And then we'll organize those sticky notes on a whiteboard or even a window or a wall. Um, and we're going to organize them into being either a procedural analysis, which I'm showing you here. So many things that we deal with are procedures. First I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this, and I've achieved the instructional goal. Sometimes um, there's knowledge tasks required. This one is strictly knowledge. It'd be something like, you know, reading a paragraph or writing a paragraph um, where it's a hierarchical thing in that I have to be able to, according to this drawing, I have to be able to master steps one, two, and three before I can master four. I have to master or know five before I can do six. And if I can do four and six, I can master the instructional goal. So if you think about it, most everything in life is a combination of these two. Um, we're doing steps across the top, but there might be things we have to know in order to do those steps. And so that's how we come up with this task analysis diagram. It is really a good idea if you can sit down with, either in person or on the phone, um, your subject matter experts and do a task analysis. In fact, I had a client who for years was having difficulty managing their relationship with their subject matter experts, and I suspect a lot of you do as well. They said when they started doing task analysis with their clients, all of a sudden um, their SMEs were so much easier to deal with because they let them in on it and they let them help design that process in a flowchart task that everybody could see and understand. So. By doing this task analysis, um, you can do it on a whiteboard or do it on flip chart paper and then keep them. You can uh, put it in a flow chart software if you want to, pass it around, let other people look at it, get sign off on it. Here's the biggest thing. One of the most time consuming things for us when we started in business was doing things over again instead of doing them right the first time. So once you have identify the task analysis and get most of the people on the project team to, to agree, yeah, this is how we do that. You will spend so much less time doing things over, your project will take less time. This is the big cost saving. It shouldn't take you a long time. In most cases, um, it should take you 6 or 7% of your total project time to build a task analysis. 
it will pay off hugely. If there's any one step that I would recommend that you take away with you out of today, if you're not doing for those 60% of you who are not doing it, give it a try. Um, it really does work. So here's um, a case study where my staff had a project that had 4,500 hours of development work. It was a pretty big project. Took over a year. Um, six and a half percent of that was allocated to task analysis. Okay, so it was 270 hours, but it was still only six and a half percent of the total budget. We correctly identified the scope and kept the project on budget for the entire time, no scope creep at all out of a 4,500 hour project. And the one single, single thing that we can attribute that to is a good task analysis. Here is an example of one I think you can pick up pretty easily putting a golf ball. So you can see across the top, there are sequential steps, plan the stroke, do the stance, um, and you can, these are things that all you have to do is watch a golfer step up there and do those things and write them down and say, is this what I just saw you do? And the golfer would say, yes, you've got your procedural task analysis done. The harder part is the knowledge part. So let's look at plan the stroke. Um, in plan the stroke, you've got to combine direction and speed in order to get a plan. And there are things you would do under predicting direction to figure out what the direction is, and there are things you would do under the speed to figure out what the speed is. You have to ask questions, well, how do you do this? How do you know that? How do you do this? How do you know that? You ask those kinds of questions, and you're going to get answers to the knowledge component of what it takes to plan that stroke. And that's all there is to doing a task analysis. Um, it takes a little practice, but it's not that hard. And, and believe me, once you start doing projects with task analysis, you'll never change. What I'd like to do right now is um, ask anybody out there who would like to make a comment. Is there somebody who's had either a good or bad experience with task analysis? Um, I'd really like you to tell us about that right now. Okay, so um, I see somebody out there who's been doing task analysis for about two or three years now, and it uh, doesn't say how, um, how they learned that, but says that what they notice is pretty much what I was saying is they, before they started doing task analysis, they would have hiccups in their content, um, and they would have to constantly stop and make changes and make changes and make changes, and they couldn't get finished with training programs. Um, the task analysis really seemed to have helped in this case. Here is a, um, on this next slide is a sample task analysis that we did for a recruiting client. This guy, an interesting guy, he was one of the best recruiters in the country, an HR recruiter. And, um, he taught workshops, but he really didn't know how he did what he did. Um, once we worked with him on a task analysis, and this was a really extensive one, it uh, probably went around the room one and a half times, but this is what it looked like. And we were able to write down and identify for him what was it that made him one of the country's top recruiters. Um, before he had gone through that process with us, he really couldn't sit down and tell you that. And he found it really difficult to teach people because he couldn't really identify it. So once again, the task analysis helps you identify um, what it is that people have to do when you finished with them. And shouldn't take that long. We're going to move on to the design phase now. And the main thing I want to talk about in the design phase is um, performance objectives. And I'm going to launch another poll here. I'd like to know um, how many of you are currently using performance objectives to help you write testing instruments. I know a lot of people out there write performance objectives, but do you use them to help you design your tests? That's what I want to know. So if you use them to design tests, give me a yes. And if you write them, but you don't necessarily use them to design your testing instruments, that would be a no. 
And what I'm seeing now with about half the votes in, <laughs> it's another 60-40 split, about 60% of you say yes, I use them to design testing instruments, and about 40% of you say no. So what I'm going to say to this is, um, you know, I used to get really tired of writing performance objectives because I didn't know what I was supposed to do with them. And I kind of figured it a waste of time. Um, but the performance objectives, and there's a specific part of them, will really help you uh, design your testing instrument. And I see that we've got about 70% of the vote in yet, and we're still looking at about 60% yes and 40% no. So go back to the slides now. And I'm going to show you a, um, a performance objective. In the, th this is uh, Robert Gagne's five-part format, uh, which I've been using for a long time. I find there's a good reason to do five parts instead of three. So the situation is simply the stimulus that you had for why should you, um, why should you perform the task that you're going to do. So the task from our task analysis says recommend the best product mix for a customer. So you can see we've got a verb and we have an object. Recommend what? Best product mix. And so the situation is, okay, we have a customer. Um, we want the student to be able to recommend what? The best product mix. Here's the magic. How? By asking probing questions, presenting benefits, and handling objections. So, and we're going to say the constraint is that has to, that has to be done with every customer. So if I look at that and I want to design a testing instrument, I look at that and I go, well, I probably can't do that with a multiple choice question. Um, somebody has to demonstrate to me that they can ask probing questions, present benefits, and handle objections. So somehow that, that begs for a role play situation, and I know that I'm going to use a rubric or a checklist, I like to just call them checklists, uh, to measure that with. That person only has to do three things. They have to ask probing questions, they present benefits, and they handle objections. Now there are a lot of different ways you could define the correct way to recommend the best product mix. But when we did our task analysis, we found out that those were the three subtasks under recommending a product mix. They fit easily into the action portion, and it makes it a very measurable way to find out if somebody has achieved this performance objective. So I'm going to look at another quick example here. This time we're going to turn a customer objection into a sales opportunity. And um, we got an angry customer this time with an objection. They must have just talked to the company that um, upgraded my um, internet line because we, inter we update, upgraded it yesterday and we were out all morning. So got an angry customer. Learner will be able to do what? Convert. And what are they going to convert? They're going to com convert the objection into a sales opportunity. Again, here's the magic part, the action. How? By restating the customer objection, offering alternatives, identifying a solution that satisfies the customer need. And once again, there can be lots of different ways, different companies, different organizations may define they have different processes for dealing with an angry customer. But the nice thing about this performance objective is we know exactly how we're supposed to do it here and once again, all we have to do is look at this um, action portion and we know exactly what kind of testing instrument we have to design and we know how to measure it. So I am very big on making sure that if I'm going to do anything in my instructional design process, I'm not doing it just to put it on the shelf. I'm doing it because I'm going to use it for something. I find that there are lots of other uses for performance objectives. Yes, yeah, some of us show them to our learners. In most cases, I find that learners don't even read them. I think they're very useful if you're designing instructor-led training for your instructors to know exactly what is expected of the learners when they're finished with them. It's great for that. Um, <clears throat> but the very best way 
is if I'm trying to design level two measurement, that is I'm measuring how much people learned, I can look at my performance objective when it's written in this way and I know exactly how to do it. So we've been talking about instructional design stuff for a while. We're kind of going back now to a, a more of a performance consulting step and it's called a blueprint meeting. This is something that we kind of added to our instructional design model. We review this model annually, and every time we develop some good ideas during the year, we, um, we add them to it. Uh, this is something that's been in it for probably the last 15 years. We have a blueprint meeting, which looks like this. Um, we try to get everybody on the project team. We want the project sponsor. We want the design team. We want the subject matter experts. Uh, sometimes we want some people who represent the learning audience. We want everybody who's on that team be in a meeting. Um, we used to be able to do these face-to-face. -face. Now they're mostly virtual. It doesn't matter. The first thing we're going to do is, is discuss the business goal. You know, somebody has told us what the business goal is, and we want to make sure that we're always cognizant to keep the business goal foremost in our mind. So we'll start out restating the business goal. Sometimes somebody in that meeting will say, no, that's not the real business goal. Here's the real business goal. Good to know. Good thing to know. Um, always start out a blueprint meeting with a business goal. These meetings will take anywhere from an hour to two hours, but they're well worth the time spent. So then we define the training goals that are going to be linked to that business goal. We might even take the opportunity to say there are some other solutions. Maybe one of the things we found is that we needed a new comp plan. Maybe one of the things we found is we needed a different staffing model. But now we're going to go on and talk about the training. So we'll use those performance objectives that we wrote um, to show the team this, these are the key objectives that we're trying to get people to be able to do. Then we'll say we'll go right next to our measurement strategy, and this is how we're going to measure and know when they got there. Really a good thing to bring measurement up early on in the meeting and early on in your process so that everybody agrees in the need to measure. Um, you can't tack measurement on at the end of a project. It never works. So we always make sure that we have agreement for our measurement strategy in the blueprint meeting. And remember, we haven't designed anything yet. All we've done is we've analyzed the task, maybe the audience, um, whatever other analysis we're going to do. We write performance objectives, and then we make sure that those are the objectives, and here's how we're going to measure them, and then we'll tell people how we're going to teach people. Finally, we get to the instructional strategy in the media. We do not mention it's going to be an e-learning program, or it's going to be an instructor-led program, or how many hours it's going to last. We don't do any of that until we know what it is that we have to accomplish. I know your clients always want to start with, well, I think we need a two-hour e-learning program. Um, when they do that, just go, sure, okay. Um, put it on the shelf. Don't think about it until you've, your design process has taken you to whatever is the best solution. We also discuss somewhat of a course outline. People have to see some content in that meeting. We try to keep it high level at this point. And we're always looking for people to push back or add information. Um, we don't just present things in this blueprint meeting. It's very much a give and take. The idea of the meeting, what we want to have happen at the end, is we have a, a collaborative idea of what's going to happen and what everybody's going to do so that we're not continually second-guessing and revisiting our process. So sometimes we'll show samples of learning materials at that blueprint meeting, at least what they're going to look like, um, if we have a pretty good idea what the media are going to be. Uh, we're also going to... Um, ask our, our team to help us agree on what is the best content for a prototype. We always like to create a prototype of, that exemplifies our instructional strategy before we begin and test it before we begin completing everything. So again, it's all about finding out where we're going, testing a little bit and doing a little bit more before we do the entire thing. It's all about not having to do things over again. And the last thing that happens in the meeting is we agree on revisions. And again, remember the goal of the blueprint meeting is for everybody to have a consensus on what it is that we're going to do going forward.
So back to the instructional design model. Here's one of my favorite parts here. Um, this is a formative evaluation. We have, we do, we, once we've had the blueprint meeting, we build that prototype that we talked about, and then we conduct a learner tryout. And um, I, I like to go back to my good friend Tiagi, he has a wonderful definition for formative evaluation. He says formative, formative is to improve and summative is to prove. So all we're doing when we do formative evaluations, we're trying to make, we're evaluating how well the learning strategy worked with our actual learners. And there's always people on the team who want to second guess it. There's always people who want to say, I think this will work, I think that'll work. And my answer to that is, why guess when you can measure? It's so easy to measure um, with a learner tryout. We get about six people. We ask about six people who are actual learners. We don't want subject matter experts. We don't want people who know the process. We want people who are the people we, we would be teaching. If it's e-learning, it's really easy. We get them to sit down with 20 or 30 minute module of the e-learning program and go through it with them and ask them questions. And we ask them to think out loud while they're going through the course. And they'll give us great information. In my book, I say that, um, that learners are your best design consultants you never knew you had. It's really interesting if you ask these people for their opinion of a prototype they really will give you great information. Um, they'll tell you things you couldn't have figured out, and if you have questions about, is this going to work better than that, just ask them, and I promise you, out of six or seven people, you will see a trend develop. You don't have to do this with 50 or 100 people in order to get trends. I've done it with as little as six or seven people. That's all we ever use, and we always get trends and learn a tremendous amount a learner tryout takes about a half a day. If you think about it, you're doing 30 minutes with six or seven people. Even if it's an instructor-led course, we can teach a 30 or 40 or 50 minute uh, module of that course to six or seven people and get great feedback. So learners can be your best design consultants. Once we've done the learner tryout, we'll using the prototype, and then we'll build everything else based on what we learned about the prototype and the last thing we do is the third bullet here is to conduct a field test. You know, everybody has to give whatever they've designed to a final audience at some point. And we simply, um, we simply ask our clients to give us about 20 people that we can ask some questions to after they've taken the training. We give them a little something to write things down on as they're going through it, and then we'll interview them afterwards. And we'll find if there's typos or if there's, you know, we might find some trends and some questions that don't work in our testing. We might find some areas that we didn't teach very well. And that gives us an opportunity to make final revisions before it goes live. Going back to the cost versus risk rule, if you have a fairly small audience, you probably don't need to conduct a field test. But as in our case, sometimes we're sending out a compliance course to 20,000 people. And you better believe I want to know how that course is going to work on 20 people before I send it out to 20,000 people. So remember the cost versus risk. I think in a lot of cases, if you're looking at should I do a learner tryout, have you done this type of instructional strategy 30 times before? Maybe you don't need to do one. Is this a new strategy, a new creative thing that your team just came up with I really want to try it out with six people and learn what I can before I build the rest of the course. So it's all about that cost versus risk and trying to keep from doing things over again. Um, did I skip a polling question here? <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay. I want to find out now. Um, I'm going to launch a poll to find out how many of you are currently using formative evaluation. So do you currently use some form of formative evaluation like I just designed to improve your learning programs? Well, we got that 60-40 thing going again. OK, about half of you have voted. And I'm seeing um, about 60% of you are saying yes. I use formative evaluation. 
Um, and about 40% of you are saying, no, I really don't. Um, is there anybody out there who wants to share with me um, an experience you've had with using formative evaluation and what it's done for you? And while we're waiting for somebody to answer on that, I, there's an interesting question here that says, um, what's the difference between task analysis and the objectives for the course? Okay, that's a good question. What I want to point out here is that every step in an instructional design process, the output of every step is the input to the next one. So the task analysis becomes the input to the performance objectives. You'll notice in the task analysis, I pointed out that every task needs to have a verb and an object. You'll also notice in the performance objectives that every performance objective um, first has a verb and then an object and then an action or how it's supposed to be done. So you can see that that task be forms the root of the performance objective. So very important to note how in instructional design, the output of one step always becomes the input to the next. OK. Um, OK, so somebody is bringing up um, Six Sigma. Um, and Six Sigma certainly is a process that uses formative evaluation type um, philosophy. And um, I think that in, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about a case study in a minute here. But in, in terms of deciding whether you should use formative evaluation or not, um, it's cost versus risk. You know how many times you've done a particular solution before and how well it works, or if you're into new territory where it doesn't work, then I would suggest that you find six sample learners, find a prototype that exemplifies your instructional strategy, um, sit with those learners one at a time, and ask them what they think and what they're doing um, as they go through that course. Um, they become your best design consultants. So just to show you where we've used this and what it's done for us as a company, um, here's a revised curriculum project that we did for a, we, a bunch of frontline workers. They had some um, software that developed all their pro that that ran all their processes, and we completely redesigned that training program for them because it wasn't working for them. So it's very important that we find out since they wanted to redesign it to make sure that it worked, we took a couple of prototypes and tested it with some sample learners first to see if it was working better than what we were redesigning. So we also had a couple of different opinions of different strategies to use in the redesign. And we had the usual situation where some people said, I think this one will work better. Some people say, I think this one will work better. So we tested both strategies, and we found out there was a clear preference among the learners for one of those strategies worked better than the other one. We did not have to guess. Um, we were able to identify a lot of functionality changes. There were a lot of things that um, we thought were good content decisions or good process decisions which weren't, and people told us. Um, those changes would have rippled through all the subsequent um, modules in the course. We found it in the module that we tested, and that saved us about eight hours of, 80 hours of work by fixing those things one time instead of in every subsequent module. Um, <clears throat> okay. So one of the things that we always test in format formative evaluation is our implementation plan. With this particular client, they had a real problem with implementation. They had a particular group of instructors who were saying, you know, we could do a better job with this course um, if those people in instructional design would design a better course. It's not us. It's the bad, it's the bad design. So our client was really nervous that, you know, what's going to happen when we put this out and the instructors don't like it? We said, invite the instructors to come watch the learner tryout. When we did that, it was so 
it was so interesting to watch the instructors get excited and see how this new program worked. Um, they saw the redesign. They saw most of all the reaction, the positive reaction of the learners, the input from the learners about what could make it better. And the instructor group was the biggest fan of the new redesign, and our client breathed a huge sigh of relief. All a wonderful output from doing a learner tryout, which took us about two days in that case. So again, what's the cost of it? Okay, this was that 4,500-hour project again. It was 150 hours, but it was only 2.7% of our total budget. That 2.7% saved us from having the instructors not criticizing it because they got to have input and also the students, um, the learners, got to see the course and went out and told everybody how good it was. And we got a lot of great information from them on how to make the course better. So it was a huge win for an investment of 2.7% of our total budget. I'm going to show you an example of a fairly simple instructional exercise that was in um, an e-learning course. This was a company that sells um, aerial lift platforms. And, um, you know, they, um, these things, whoops, oh no, is this not going to work? Um, there, I'm trying to make the, there it goes. There you go. Never mind. Got it. Okay, so you can see the picture of the lift platform, and it was showing you a two-wheel steer, a four-wheel steer, and a crab steer. Okay, so now if you look really careful in that dark shadow where those black tires are, you can sort of see the wheels changing. And of course, the picture changes size. The idea is you're supposed to be able to see the difference from a two-wheel steer to a four-wheel steer to a crab steer. What you're looking at right there is a picture of a two-wheel steer. Okay, so that's one option for how to solve this problem. So now we're going to go to an animation that we also thought might help. And in this case, here's the two-wheel front steer. There it goes. Okay, and then here comes the four-wheel steer. There it goes. And then lastly, here's my favorite one. I wish my Miata could do this, the crab steer. So the client wanted to use the photo, I think mostly because they took the photograph. We took these two approaches and put them in front of six or seven learners. And do you think any one of those learners preferred the photo over the animation? Well, no. So we didn't really have to argue this with our client anymore. The client watched the learners go, oh, yeah, the animation works better. End of story. That's a fairly quick, powerful example of how conducting a learner tryout can keep you from having to argue with people. Um, you just let the learners figure it out. Again, why guess when you can measure? So all this so far has been done so that when we get to the production or the development phase of the project, we're not doing things over and over again. We have good testing instruments because um, we have good performance objectives. The performance objectives work because they came from a task analysis. And the task analysis works because it's linked um, to performance that's required to achieve a business goal. So this is where we as a company, and I'm sure you do too, spend most of your money actually making learning products. The idea is to do this as efficiently as possible and not have to go do things over and over again. Um, and so here's the field test, which is the second part of the formative evaluation, the last thing we do before we go into implementation. And finally, um, in implementation, um, I think I've seen more projects fail because of bad implementation than any other reason. Lots of times people develop great learning programs and they and they just kind of fail to either do an implementation plan or they fail to see one through. They fail to follow up on that. And um, it's not a very expensive step, but it certainly keeps, um, it certainly keeps 
it's an insurance policy to make sure that what you think is going to happen or what you haven't designed to happen actually does happen. And then also an implementation is where the actual measurement begins to happen. Um, I work with uh, Jack and Patty Phillips from the ROI Institute, and I have uh, their five levels of measurement and evaluation, very similar to Kirkpatrick. I like them both. The thing I like in this reaction, number one here, is I think it's really important to pay attention to um, do people I don't want to just know their reaction to it, but I want to find out, do you think this is going to work on the job? Um, what's the value of the program to you as you use this on the job? Will it help you? That's, I think, the most important piece of reaction data. And the learning, um, we've already talked about how to design the learning measurements from the performance objective. And again, if your performance objectives are written off a of task analysis, you're likely going to have the right things in there and you're going to be able to develop a level two measurement instruments that work. And then number three is application. Do people actually use this on the job? That's the kind of thing where you have to let the training program happen and then you come back you know, a few weeks or a couple of months later and you see if you can observe people or managers tell you that they're using those skills on the job. Um, it's somewhat uh, 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 it's not always a real objective. Sometimes it's somewhat sub subjective, but to find out what you can about the actual application is really important. And then here's a big one, the business impact. A little bit hard to measure, but you know, we started this whole conversation off with a business goal, and we want to get results out of our training. So it really helps to see did that training work on the job and did it have an impact on the business? We knew what the business goal was to begin with, so we should be able to go out and measure whether we achieved it or not. And then the return on investment simply measures, did we spend more on the training program than we did on the results we got from it? That would be a negative return on investment. Or did we spend a little bit on the training program and we had a really big pay, payback on the business side? You know, people are sometimes scared to do this. Um, some pe sometimes people say, well, they don't measure because they don't want to find out. In those instances where you're asked to develop training, you think training is not the solution, not going to solve the problem, is sometimes it's a good idea to, um, to plot that negative return on investment that you can say, well, what did we learn here? Did we learn that training was not a good investment of our money? Sometimes you want to show good things, and sometimes you want to show bad things. So keep in mind that having a negative ROI is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it proves a good point. And here's my favorite chart, and then I'm going to turn it over to that um, last exercise where you get involved, like I said. Um, here's a study that the uh, Jack Patty at the ROI Institute did, and what we as training people measure and what executives want to see. So more than half of us measure that reaction dip. 22% of executives care. 32% of us, and I'm appalled that only 32% of us, according to this study, measure our learning. And again, only 28% of executives care. Now the application, we continue to drop. Only 11% of us do, to the, do that. 61% of, of our executives want to see that people use those skills on the job. And then business impact, 8% of us measure that. 96% of, of our executives are interested in the business impact of that training program that you just spent your time and the company's money on. And only 8% of us measure that. 4% of us do an ROI study, and even Jack and Patty say probably are not going to do an ROI study on more than 5 or 10% of your projects. 74% of executives are interested in that. So I think this is a very telling chart. And now I've got that exercise that allows you to um, apply that cost versus risk uh, rule that I talked about at the beginning of the program. In this case, we have um, 
a scenario for you. It's a software upgrade that our company is doing. And uh, you're the training people and your clients upgrading their infrastructure by investing a lot of money in some new software systems to support frontline personnel. It's a major initiative for your company and you've been asked by several line managers to develop training for new systems. Okay, new systems, gonna need training, got it. Question for you all then, do you need to reframe the training request for the use of, <clears throat> through the use of reactive performance consulting? So remember that's the reactive meeting where somebody has said, hey, I want training. You think you need to reframe that request or ask a bunch of questions um, to find out if training is really needed. Um, and I'm just gonna ask for comments here. I would like you to um, not only give me an answer to the question, but give me some idea of, um, okay, I'm reading some of these questions here. Okay, well obviously somebody says, I'm probably not gonna go to a lot of trouble here to reframe the question. And uh, I can agree with that because we know that it's a brand new system. We probably need training. I got another question for you though. Is it necessary to identify the business goal for this major initiative? What do you think about that? Again, just write your comments for me, please. Okay, and um, the answers I'm getting here, I got a couple people say that they probably think it is necessary to identify the business goal. And the comment I'd make there is you can see in the first bullet, they're spending several million dollars in new software. Um, we can teach people how to use the software, but there's probably a reason that the company invested several million in new software. There's probably some business goal they wanted to achieve by that. And really, this is a case, folks, where training has a huge impact on whether people are going to achieve the business goal or not. So if we don't know the business goal, we're just kind of shooting in the dark, teaching people the best we can to use the software, better that we know what they're supposed to do with it from a business perspective, and then we can reinforce that in the training program. Um, and the next question, same scenario. Would you measure the business impact or the, R or the ROI on this project? Would you take the time, remember cost versus risk, is this a project where I would wanna ask my client to measure business impact or ROI? And you know, you're, you're gonna need help to do this. Um, you need resources within other parts of the company other than training to get out data to see um, if these things are, are um, if you had a business impact, that's not something you can do alone. So this is something you have to convince your client to do. Okay. Okay, and what I'm seeing, well, absolutely is one good answer. Definitely yes, <laughs> always. Um, I, I don't know that I'd agree with always, um, but definitely yes, in this case where um, so much money was invested. I think if you try to do measurement always, you know, we get those projects sometimes that are those tech in a box training projects where somebody says, I don't really care what the results are here. I just got to show some regulator that I did training. Um, probably not a good place to uh, spend your measurement dollars. And so now we have another scenario. Um, your client's introducing an entirely new sales process for 1,200 performers across the enterprise. There's, okay, so this is salespeople now. There's a lot of mistrust and ambivalence among the sales managers. Well, okay, salespeople. Uh, you've been asked to, hey, and I'm a salesperson myself. You've been asked to develop a series of instructional training programs for this new sales process. So. 
question for you. Would you really need to write performance objectives? And um, tell me if you would and why, why or why not. Just uh, write your answers in here. Okay. Okay, wait a minute. Yes, what's important? Oops, I lost that one. Okay, um, I'm seeing a couple people say, yes, I need to use uh, performance objectives because it's really important that I measure people in this situation. Um, the new sales process, somebody's going to be looking to see if you got a sales increase. And um, so you're not going to get a sales increase unless you can measure a performance change. And so that makes the measurement portion of this, the level two measurement portion of this really important. Um, you need to have those performance objectives to be able to write better tests. And um, next question on the same uh, sales process scenario again. Other than task analysis, what, are, what other types of analysis should you conduct? We didn't really talk about this. Um, in this presentation, we only talked about task analysis. We talked about performance consulting as an analysis. But are there any other types of analysis that you do out there um, that you think would be important in this particular situation? Okay, change management. Somebody says, absolutely. You have a huge change here, so change management is important. The type of analysis that you would need for change, uh, change management is what we call uh, either a learning environment analysis or a core culture analysis. So in order to make a change, you have to find out what the current culture in the organization is and then identify the culture that you want in order to make the change happen. I've seen also this kind of goes along with the implementation plan. Um, you can teach people different processes, but if, the, if their managers or the corporate culture doesn't support that new process or new change, it's not going to be successful. So, yes, I would say in this case where you have this Second bullet, mistrust and ambivalence um, points towards uh, a change management, as one of our people pointed out, and that points towards um, analyzing the corporate culture. Um, managers have more to do with reinforcing good behaviors out of training than any other single thing. Um, there's a, been a lot of research studies that prove that. So um, on the same sales process, is it worth the effort to conduct a learner tryout? Why or why not? And just key your answers in again. Somebody says, ideally, you should do that and maybe um, conduct an ROI. And then somebody says, um, whoops. <laughs> somebody says, what if they prefer to bury their heads in the, in the sand? <laughs> and I think that was referring to the ROI, pro the ROI and the measurement on the last one. Okay, and I think um, what I'm getting here is a consensus that yes, people think it's a good idea to do a learner tryout. It, chances are, with um, with this situation with the mistrust and the mistrust and the ambivalence among these sales managers, uh, you need to kind of find out how your strategy is landing before you develop the rest of the course. You're going to get great feedback. Salespeople are very um, upfront. They'll tell you what they like and what they don't like. Um, they're the first audience I would turn to to conduct the learner tryout and find out if my strategy is working or not. They will tell you. Um, <clears throat> Now this project has a tight schedule. 
you need to conduct a blueprint meeting. Remember that's the meeting that we'll do after the design to get consensus from the design team. Um, takes about two or three hours in some cases. Do we have time um, in this tight schedule to conduct a blueprint print meeting? So tell me if you would do that or not and why. Okay, yes, and get input from sales managers on the process. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely is another one. So uh, I think the consensus here is, yeah, um, doing a blueprint meeting is a good idea, especially here where there's already, you know there's already um, a lot of, again, the mistrust and ambivalence. I would really, that's, that's a huge red flag to say there's high risk that I'm going to have a lot of people not accepting whatever solution I come up with. I want to have them hash that out in a blueprint meeting before I've developed my training program before uh, I go to the, all the trouble to develop the training program. So this is a case, whenever you have um, a high risk like that with people having, they probably had their own process or different processes, they may not um, trust the entirely new one, and uh, to get everybody together and, and make sure that you agree on what's going to happen um, and where that project is going to go before you go to all the work is a really good idea. So that is, um, <clears throat> I'm going to open this up to questions now. Um, I'm also going to mention that um, everything that has been in this is also in this book, training by the same title, Training That Delivers Results. Um, and uh, right now I, I'd like to uh, open it up to any um, free-form questions that you have because we've got uh, about three minutes here. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dick. Um, we do probably have time for, we'll try to get a few questions in, um, but while we wait, let me just share a little bit how you can keep in touch. Um, let's go to uh, Dick's contact information is on that slide right now, so you can connect with him after the session, and he has some great resources there as well. And then also you can connect with us. Um, please connect with us on all of our social media and also register for the, our weekly webinar Wednesdays at hrdqu.com. All right, and let's see. All right, it looks like our first question is coming from Pat. How do you convince clients to spend time and money on measurement? Um, that's a tough one. I would say the 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 thing that will get you the most success in that is to start early. Uh, we start in the design phase with a testing plan, um, and then we take that testing plan to the blueprint meeting, and um, we try to sell it at the blueprint meeting. Uh, we ask people, if you have this business goal, it's important to get this, get this business goal. Do you not need to measure what's working, what's not working, and usually we can get a consensus. So. Biggest piece of advice is there is start early. All right, great, thank you. And our next question is coming from Lisa. What are some good tips for influencing uh, stakeholders to allow time for task analysis up front? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I think in a lot of cases your stakeholders um, don't necessarily need to make the decision on that. I think you and your manager need to make the decision on that. Um, What's going to convince stakeholders is results. So start with those champions, those clients that you know you have an affinity for working with and you're likely to, um, to be able to work with in a, in a good way and show the results. Do the task analysis. The subject matter experts will sing your praises. They'll tell the other people um, who have to sign off on it, how helpful it was. Um, it, task analysis is one of those things we hand clients and they look at it and they say, wow, I've never seen the entire process on one piece of paper like this. This is great. So I would suggest you um, don't always ask for permission. Um, get it done and then let the results speak for themselves. All right, great. Thank you. And let's just do one more. This is coming from Greg. Do you take learning styles into consideration and at what design point? <laughs> Good question, Greg, and I, I do have a fairly um, outspoken opinion on that. There is not much research that says that learning styles have any impact on learning. 
yes, we all may have certain preferences and learning styles, but according to the preponderance of research, even if we are given learning that's not in our sweet spot of learning style, there's there, it hasn't research hasn't shown that people learn better in their preference as opposed to a style that's not their preference. So based on the research um, and my own observations, I haven't seen that learning styles make a whole lot of difference. Now, the thing that does make a difference to me is what people say in the learner tryout. Um, certain preferences there that, that might work and show evidence that they actually work I will go with, but I'm, I'm not, um, in my career, I've learned that learning styles are not something I spend a lot of time and money looking at. All right, great questions. I wish we had more time, but um, Dick, would you just like to add any final thoughts before I go ahead and wrap up this session? Well, Sarah, thanks to you for one thing, and um, thanks to HRDQ for having me. Uh, I hope that you will take at least one thing that I've discussed today and give it a try. Um, if you want more information on this, you can go to the um, www.dhanshaw website and click on the resources tab. There's a bunch of free resources and instructions on how to do things there. Um, but just do me a favor and if, at least take just one thing from today and try it. All right, Dick, thank you again so much. And for the attendees, if we did not get to answer your question, you're going to receive those emailed responses um, probably mid-next week from Dick Answered. So we appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webinar informative. Thank you.